was had many nuances in it, uh, which is probably why they had trouble with it. But uh, the leaflet um, was designed to create a desire to want to um, to want to uh, organize the province and the and the cities and the towns to to determine uh, a different outcome when the financial collapse hits. Because when the financial collapse hits. You have a window of opportunity for the federal government to act in a way that essentially implements the equivalent of Glass-Steagall and the credit system in, in the period of time before the collapse, when, between the time the collapse occurs and, and the disintegration of the society that occurs because of the collapse, you have a window of opportunity to implement all these policies. And that's what the, the leaflet was primarily designed to, to lay out uh, a directionality for the municipalities and the, and the uh, province to to lobby or influence in advance the outcome of the behavior or actions of the federal government with respect to the to a coming financial collapse. That was the intention of the lease. So it wasn't just a resolution. It was not just intended to get a resolution through, but rather to, to have a have a discussion of what should actually be done in a financial uh, uh, crisis. So that's. That's, um, <coughs> that was the intention of the leaflet. So it wasn't, it wasn't just a, a leaflet supporting Glass-Steagall, but it was rather a, a leaflet. And the timing of the leaflet was pretty good because that, that is what's coming. And, and so the question is, is there a discussion about doing something else? Because bail-ins and bail-outs will not work in a crisis. They, it, it's, they're just all they're doing with the bail with the bail-ins and the, uh, the bailouts. You know because they're bailing out the banks. But the bail-ins, all they're doing is playing a confidence game. When the crisis hits, there's no amount of bail-ins are going to do anything but make it worse. So, okay. So I just wanted to add that to to uh, what Robbie was saying. Now tonight, um, I'm going to talk about genius. Uh, the genius first of Vladimir Putin, then the genius of Xi Jinping, then I'm going to reference the genius of Lyndon LaRouche a little bit, and finally the genius of Alexander Hamilton. And tonight I want people to take a step back from the fray and look at what is unfolding before our very eyes. And and from the standpoint of, of these geniuses, because these geniuses um, are directing the direction of, of humanity at this time, both from the past and, and the present. And, and we also face a historical problem that we have to overcome, which has its uh, uh, which has this, it's, it's a remnant of, Ro of Rome and European colonization and slavery in the United States, and I'm going to go into that a little bit. It has it relates to the current situation. Now, I'm going to start with the genius of Putin. And uh, Putin uh, has initi initiated a process of developments uh, that, that began with his. Uh, he acted in, on Syria, but the process of development began on, on with his UN speech uh, September 28, 2015. And in that UN speech, he um, in that UN speech he uh, he laid out the concept of of of, 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 of the respect of sovereignty and the need for uh, a war against terrorism and the collaboration of nations and a, and a community of principle among nations. And, and then he went, then they, they did that intervention, he did that intervention to Syria later that year to tip the balance away from what was going to happen, uh, which was the ISIS and the, uh, was going to take power in Syria. Now, using the leverage of that situation to shift the situation in Turkey, 
he simultaneously began dip, through diplomatic means and economic means, well, diplomatic means primarily, he started uh, uh, to lay out a different, a different policy for the region. <clears throat> that Syria's, Syria will remain intact, uh, the nations of the region will remain un intact. And, and using the, 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 the fact that there's the Assad government, the Syrian government, survived and was beginning to then uh, go on the offensive against ISIS, he used that to then move to, to create diplomatic channels and back channels of every kind with the countries in the region. Uh, Iran, uh, Israel, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, all the countries in the region that the Russian diplomats went there and instead of just saying uh, to them, you know, are you the saying to them, look, this is not going to work, this terrorism thing isn't going to work, this whole thing isn't going to work, it's a disaster. We need to have something better. We need to work something out. We need to have everybody involved in the discussion process. Uh, we're not here to be, expect we're not, what Putin kept saying was we're not here to impose our will, we're not here to expand our power in that sense. We're here to try to bring everyone together. We are not here to tell you what to do. We want you to participate in the process that's in your interest. And that's genius. That's genius. When a, when a, leading, when a leader of that does that and uses the power of, 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 of Russia to do that, it's just genius. So, so then, Obviously, everyone of Turkey began to realize that this thing was not going to go in, in the direction that he had been promised. You know, he had been recruited by the Obama administration that Turkey was going to be the power in the region, and you know, you would have your new Ottoman Empire uh, based upon uh, the destruction of Syria and Iraq, and and then you had Egypt and the Muslim Brotherhood, and and everything would be you know great for the Ottoman, the new Ottoman Sultan. But when he began to realize that that wasn't going to work, the Russians were, were there, you know, encouraging him to open up channels and what have you. Then this uh, Russian plane was down, and it later is determined that he didn't, that everyone did not give the order from what we can tell for the, for the downing of the Russian. That came uh, from, from, from the military, from the, from the NATO-connected uh, Turkish military. Well, I'm not 100% sure on that. I don't want to say it, but that's what it looks like. So then... The, the Russians cut off all trade for a while, but they kept the dialogue going. Eventually, Erdogan began to say, well, you know, maybe I ought to work with the Russians. Maybe at least I got to. So then the U.S. and NATO tried to pull a coup on Erdogan, and I think the Russians gave him advance notice just in time, and the coup didn't come off. And then Erdogan just wiped out the, the independent power of the military, he kicked the U.S. I believe he kicked the U.S. out of their out of their bases, uh, and that was huge. So, but what did Putin do? He brought two countries which had been had relatively good relations before all of this uh, into a discussion process called Astana, and the idea was Iran is very much involved in helping the Assad government. Turkey was very much involved in the, in, in a war with the Assad government. Now he's bringing the two together, saying, okay, Turkey has interests, uh, Iran has interests in Syria, we, you t we, we want to work something out so that everyone, you know, we, we're going we're gonna to preserve Syria as a nation. We're going to let the Syrians decide what they want, but we're, we're not ignoring you. you, you are part of the process. So the Astana process then brought Iran and Turkey together. Now bringing Iran and Turkey together, you bring one is a Shia, the other is Sunni. You, you, you immediately undermine the whole Shia, Shia Sunni operation of creating a, 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 a war between Shia and Sunni, which is what the whole thing was all about. That's what they did in Iraq. They, 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 they manipulated it so that you ended up with these, uh, you know, that's how they got ISIS. Part of how they got ISIS, but not completely. But anyhow. So, so then, at the same time, Putin is going to Israel, and Putin is going to Saudi Arabia, Putin is going to uh, the UAE, Putin is going to all these other, the Russians are going to all these other people and saying, look, 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 why don't you, 
why don't we work together on this? Well, I mean, this is not going to work. Terrorism isn't going to work. Uh, now, you've got to understand, the U.S. and NATO, but specifically the U.S., with the British support, of course, have put, made a massive investment in, 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 in breaking the area of, of creating ISIS, of creating Al-Qaeda, creating all of this. Massive U.S. investment in all of this. Uh, 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 former uh, General Petraeus, you know, all these all these generals were like specialists in, in, in special warfare and in, in, in special ops. They weren't they weren't like Army, Navy, or or, or uh, Air Force. They were like specialists in, in ops, and they thought that in counterinsurgency they called. So they thought that they had actually that this was the way to break up the region and prevent the development of of Russia and China eventually, and, and, and create and then expand this into the interior of Russia and China, and just and this is their empire of chaos to prevent the empire development. Well, every, the establishment of the United States, for the most part, was completely involved in this, uh, at least under Obama. There, not everyone in the military supported this, but it was the predominant uh, establishment view that this was, this was their policy. And the neocons were on, on board, the liberals were on board, the, the Hillary Clinton people were on board, and the whole thing started to melt away as, and this is genius, this is genius. You don't, you don't try to win a military conflict, you try to engage it in such a way that you bring people together around, around something that's in their interest. Now, the Astana process is now going on, and, and then Trump won the election on, on, in part on saying we're not going to, we're not going to, we're going to fight terrorism and we're not going to, you know, support these, these wars. So, so, but that's not, it's not conclusive because the United States is still playing games, uh, you know, unfortunately. But nonetheless, this process has occurred. And, now this doesn't mean that Erdogan is good or anyone is good. It certainly doesn't mean the Saudis are good or the Israelis are good. Uh, but, That's not the issue. The issue is how do you take the Israelis, how do you take the Saudis, how do you take the Turks, how do you take the Iranians, and extricate them out of this conflict, divide and conquer conflict situation, and bring them into an understanding of what, uh, of how they're going to work together. Yes, they committed crimes. Erdogan committed massive crimes. Israel committed massive crimes. The Saudis have committed ma even more massive crimes. Well, maybe not as much as, I mean, look what the Israelis have done to the Palestinians. Look what the Saudis have done through, through the terrorists, through the backing of terrorists. Yeah, but, but that's not, you don't, you're not going to win, you've got to win the peace. You're not, you're not going to win the war, you're going to win the peace. And that, that's the power, that's genius. That's genius. Now, so, so now, right now, the Saudis are exhibiting their first, indication of, of looking into the possibility of becoming at least part of this process. Uh, I think the king went to Russia, the Saudi foreign minister hinted at, at, at the first negative hint at the United States. The Saudis are going to buy uh, some military hardware from Russia. It's uh, not that they're going to be able, not that they're going to know how to use it, but, <laughs> but, but it's a, also part of this process. And also, uh, so now, so now, what does the British do? What do the British policy is? What's what's the new what's the new policy that's coming from the British? And also, the Israelis is to play the final card in the deck in the Middle East. What's the final card in the deck? the The religious war thing is now is is is, is falling apart. The final card in the deck. What do the Syrians have a lot of? What do the Turks have a lot of? What do the Iraqis have a lot of? What do the, the Armenians have a significant number of? Kurds. Kurds. <laughs> Kurds. And the British have been preparing this one for over 100 years. Uh, and now they're, it's right because as Iraq became weaker, the autonomy of the Kurds became stronger. As, as Syria became 
under attack, the Syrians made a deal with the, with the Syrian Kurds and they became stronger. I would, Iran has, a, ha, has to deal with the Kurdish terrorist movement just like uh, Turkey was dealing with the PKK. So all of a sudden now we have the Kurdish issue. Now, two things are happening with that. One is that that's your last, I think that's the last deck in, <coughs> except for the Iranian, Trump and Iran and Israel and Iran, I think that's probably maybe the last deck that they have to play, last card in the, the deck they have to play to blow the place up. But that's also bringing Iran and Turkey and Iraq and Syria together because these countries are now having to deal with the fact that neither one, nobody wants the Kurdish independent, uh, uh, independence to take place in northern Iraq. Autonomy, yes, but not independence. So, now, so this signals that Putin does know what the empire is. That the empire at the center is run by the British, but that dumb giants and other auxiliaries have to be brought into the new system to avoid a nuclear war. Because you want to you wanna bring down the empire, but you don't want to have a nuclear war. Now, none of this, none of this, uh, none of what Putin has done since since his speech before the UN was e expected. How is a country with 150 million, 140, 150 million people? Yes, they have a nuclear arsenal. Yes, they're over abroad. But how are they able to pull this off? Well, they had China helping. Well, what does this mean? Now, you want to know why the Russia, 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 Russia thing is going on in the U.S.? Everybody's freaked out about Russia. They're freaked out about RT. They're freaked out about everything. Why? Because this was not part of the plan. This was a total disruption of the New World Order, or whatever they want to call it. This is not supposed to happen. You know, Hillary Clinton, we came, we saw, he, he died. <laughs> right? This is, this is not part of that. You know, that was with Gaddafi, Gaddafi. You know, that's, that's not part of that triumphal uh, end of history uh, neocon view. It's, it's completely been reversed, being reversed. And so a lot of people say, well, you know, Obama's at fault. He didn't stand up to the Russians. You know, blah, 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 blah. You know, you know all this stuff. It's like the, the whole in, internal structure of the of the uh, establishment of the United States is, is disintegrating. And they're blaming Putin because he's a genius. And he, he deserves some of the blame. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now, however, none of this would be possible without the genius of Xi Jinping of China. And none of what Putin is doing uh, would work if, if not also for the genius of Xi Jinping. His genius is to fully commit China to doing something none would ever expect China to do. What China is doing now, starting with the announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative, is completely unprecedented in history for China to do. Except maybe back in the Roman days. Now, you have to understand Chinese culture and Chinese civilization is very, somewhat insular. The people who, who are in Chinese culture are not necessarily people who feel that they are responsible for, for the fate of the human race. So not only was this a bold move on his part, but there was no guarantee that what he's doing is going to be successful, and if it's not, it would be that disastrous for him uh, as a leader. He took the initiative to go with the Belt and Road Initiative, which is now uh, a little over four years in, in the process. And it's not just simply an economic plan, it is the new system as expressed in economics. So with this, you have the actual system that Putin will be recruiting nations to give up their uh, confrontations and, and conflicts for joining the system. The system is being is created by the Chinese, but it's the Russians who are playing the serious diplomatic role um, of, 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 of leveraging the, the process, uh, particularly in the Middle East. Now, 
In order to do this, he had to crack down on the Chinese uh, leadership. In order to have the uh, authority within the, within the Communist Party to be able to carry this out. And also, he had to clean up a lot of the party. Uh, and so, so this is having an incredible impact. And you've all been reading about it, you've all been hearing about it, and it's, it, it's, the impact has reached such as, it's now starting to crack into the open. Many different parts of the world that you wouldn't even imagine. California, Jerry Brown was at the um, China Day, which is, I think, October 2nd, which is the, the day that the communists took power in China. And uh, he was there announcing that he was sought only for the, for the Belt and Road Initiative and that, and that um, California was joining the Silk, the new Silk Road. <laughs> and then, none other than uh, a few days later in Scotland, uh, Gordon Brown was chairing a meeting on the Belt and Road Initiative and was saying that this was a great thing for, for, Brit, for Great Britain to be part of. Gordon Brown, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer and, and former uh, prime, uh, prime Minister. Uh, two Palestinian organizations that are not always on good terms, Hamas and Hezbollah. Fatah. I, uh? I thought it was Hamas and Fatah. Uh? Hamas and Fatah. Kevin. Fatah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Fatah. Hamas and Fatah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I, missed, I missed on that one. I'm getting old. Uh, anyhow, uh, they're now being brought together uh, by the Chinese around a common uh, development uh, policy for the Palestine. And, and in this context, you have Donald Trump going to China within three weeks. I mean, going to Asia for a 10-day tour in Asia, uh, Japan, South Korea, China, Vietnam, and the Philippines. Now, we got to look at the issue of Trump <coughs> from this standpoint. The, Trump is president because the system has lost its support within the population. So he's, he's a product He's coming into the White House as a product of not his own doing per se, although that's part of it, but of the, of the changed circumstances in the world. So the question is, will Trump ultimately go to nuclear war with Russia and China? That's the big issue. The longer things go on and there's no nuclear war, the more the Belt and Road Initiative is consolidated, the more countries join the Astana process, the more the world shifts. As European nations undergo massive instability due to internal, financial, and other crises, political crises that are going on with their population. And Germany is a very good case. Germany was the most stable country in Europe up until the elections that occurred recently. And in those elections, the two major parties lost dramatically. While they still had enough between them to have a majority, the, the SPD uh, uh, decided to rebuild and not be, become part of the, the government. So this left the, the CDU, CSU coalition to have to form a government with the Greens and the Free Democratic Party. And the Free Democratic Party is anti-sanctions towards Russia, the, the Greens are violently for sanctions on, the, on Russia. And, and, but the other factor is that the, uh, the two parties that did the best in the eastern part of Germany were the Linke Party and the, Link, and the Alternative for Deutschland. So the two, the leftist party and the right wing party did the best, not the major parties. So the eastern part of Germany is, is not really represented in the government. So you have a government where the eastern part that, that came over after the fall of the wall is not represented in the, in the will, will not be represented in the federal government. So that's a very serious uh, issue. That's a very serious situation. So that, that creates instability in Germany. So the most stable country in, in Europe has now become un politically unstable. Now, so this is a, these are processes that are going on in Spain. 
you have another politically unstable situation because of the austerity that was imposed on Spain uh, under the European Union and under the bailout of the banks. Spain was only not far, far above Greece in terms of what it did to its population, and this is this is causing the the disintegration of Spain because you have these ethnic elements that want to leave, like the Basque and the Catalans. So, so this is a, a good example of what happens to a nation when you impose these policies. It opens a door for separatist tendencies, which the British will, will, will promote, because they would rather have a weak Spain rather than a strong Spain that can actually represent the people of Spain, but not that Spain is really doing that right now. So, uh, so now I come to LaRouche. Uh, he began in 1965 to create a movement in anticipation of the collapse of both the Soviet system and the Western uh, financial system, Western capital system. He began preparing a movement to, de uh, to propose alternatives. Uh, his breakthrough in economics, which you can begin to learn about, only gave him not only gave them a forecasting power, but the power to begin organizing nations around policies that would give them long-term survivability. The assault on LaRouche and those working with him drew, the, the, uh, uh, drew out also our, our opponents, because they had, to, they had to manifest themselves in the attacks on us, or on Indira Gandhi, or on anybody internationally that was working with us, or Portillo. So this created an obvious uh, uh, problem for us, but it also established our role in, internationally because of the attacks that we experienced. Th that program of LaRouche that was developed over 40 years is now coming into play with the Belt and Road Initiative. The very, the very ideas, the very concepts are now being applied. Um, and, and under China and Russia's leadership. So now I'm going to go to Alexander Hamilton. Uh, he and three close associates as young men at King's College uh, in New York, uh, which is now Columbia, became the core leadership under George Washington in the Revolutionary War. He and his associates, uh, and I refer people to Bob Ingram's article um, on, uh, uh, Bob Ingram's article is entitled, um, I'll send this to everybody if you don't already have it. It's entitled um, Manhattan's Struggle for Human Freedom Against the Slave Power of Virginia. This article is revolutionary and, and, and historic. It, it overthrew many of the mistaken notions that people had in our movement about American history. And it really hit, people, hit a lot of the leadership of the movement square in the jaw. And uh, there's, still, there's, still, there's still some people that are having trouble with what uh, Robert Ingram did. But anyhow, his, his article is, is incredible, and I'll send it to you. So some of what I'm going to say goes into this. And, I, and the, reason I'm, the reason I'm bringing up this article is that uh, the reason I'm bringing up this article is that um, this has a lot to do with the current situation that we have inside the United States. So this is going to help understand the problem we have with Trump and also the problem we have with the United States in general. Uh, now, Hamilton understood slavery. He understood it. He grew up with it as a, as a, as a, as a, as a young man. At age 14, he was running a, a large commercial empire of his benefactor. He was recruited as a young man to go to New York, and at around the age of 20, he was, he was chosen by George Washington as his aide de camp. Now, the important thing about Hamilton is he understood this, this idea that human freedom is not is a question of economic development. It's a question of scientific and technological progress. And the whole idea of 
from his standpoint of having a republic was not to just have another nation or to have uh, some other um, entity where the people there are free to do whatever they want. His idea was to, to, to use the opportunity of being free from an oligarchy to drive education, to drive science, to drive the development of manufacturers. And uh, in his three reports to Kant, in his four reports to Kant, three reports primarily, he, uh, where he laid out a national bank, a credit system, and the development of manufacturers, he laid out all the tools that a nation that wants to liberate the people from the backwardness of, 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 of agrarian peasantry and, and so forth could use. All the tools. And, <coughs> and he also led the fight for the U.S. Constitution, which is a very bitter fight. Now, now, according to Bob Ingram, and I believe him to be correct, Hamilton's vision was from the beginning under assault from, from, from Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was an absolute opponent of Hamilton's vision from the very beginning, from the founding of the country. Now, that's not to say that Jefferson wasn't brilliant, but he was determined that the United States would, be, would become a slave empire. And this has all been whitewashed. But what Bob goes through is, is, is show you that, that Jefferson led the battle to make slavery the power of the new nation, the slave power. And the huge fight that took place in the Constitution was over the representation of apportionment of represent uh, rep, uh, of congressional representation. The South wanted all slaves to be counted as one, even though none of them had any votes or anything like that. And, and Hamilton and the key person who worked with Hamilton, Governor Morris, wanted to either free the slaves and then they can vote, they can represent actual voters, or, or they have no vote. And, <coughs> and I'm going to read you from Governor Morris in this fight. And this is a significant, uh, this is in the article. And uh, this is uh, Morris rose and faced the entire of the assembly proceedings of the Constitutional Convention. He said the following. Upon what principle is it that slaves shall be computed in the representation? Are they men? Then make them citizens and let them vote. Are they property? Why then is no other property included? The houses in Philadelphia are worth more than all the wretched slaves that cover the rice swamps of South Carolina. The admission of slaves into the representation was fairly explained comes to this, that the inhabitant of Georgia and South Carolina who goes to the coast of Africa and in defiance of the most sacred laws of humanity tears away his fellow creatures from their dearest connections and damns them to the most cruel bondage yes, shall have more votes in a government instituted for the protection of the rights of mankind than the citizens of Pennsylvania or New York who view with laudable horror such a nefarious practice. Domestic slavery is the most prominent feature in the aristocratic continents of the proposed constitution. The vassalage of the poor has ever been the favorite offspring of the aristocracy. And what is the proposed compensation to the northern states for the sacrifice of every principle of right and every impulse of humanity? They are to bind themselves to march their militias for the defense of the southern states, for the defense against the very slaves of whom they complain. They must supply vessels and seamen in case of foreign attack. On the other side, the southern United States 
are not to be restrained from importing fresh supplies of wretched Africans may. They are to be encouraged to do it by the assurance of their having votes in the national government increased in proportion and are at the same time to have their exports and their slaves exempt from all constitutions for the public service. Slavery is a nefarious institution, the curse of heaven on the states where it prevails. Compare the free regions of the middle states where a rich and noble cultivation marks the prosperity and happiness of the people with the misery and poverty which overspread the barren wastes of Virginia, Maryland, and other states having slaves. Travel through the whole continent and you behold the prospect continually varying with the appearance and disappearance of slavery. The moment you leave the eastern states and enter New York, the effects of the institution become visible. Passing through those jerseys and entering Pennsylvania, every criterion of superior improvement witnesses the change. Proceed softly and every step you take through the great region of slaves represents a desert increasing with the increasing proportion of these wretched beings. So, um, so, it's a familiar story there. Now, <coughs> why am I bringing this up? Because Jefferson and then later Madison and then later Monroe, they were organizing to expand the number of slave states. And they were doing everything possible to block the infrastructure development of the North, especially New York. Uh, while Hamilton's report on the subject of manufacturers and the establishment of the first national bank, and then later uh, the establishment of the second national bank, represented a tool for massive progress, that tool was not properly used. It was not properly used to unleash the productive powers of the nation because of the slave power. And it was only later on that Governor Morris was able to work with DeWitt Clinton, uh, who became governor of New York, to actually create the Erie Canal, which uh, once the Erie Canal was built in the 1820s, and then, then you could develop the North. You could have, uh, you, you had a canal that went from New York City to the Great Lakes. And, it, and that connected, that began to connect up the whole region with the connection of this canal, you could develop the whole region. Then immigrants started to pour in from Europe along and they could develop. They could develop uh, uh, Ohio, uh, they could develop New York, they could develop uh, the New England states and so forth. And New York became a major port. Uh, it was only, however, it was also only in the 1820s that New York uh, got rid of slavery. Uh, there's a lot that, that's in the article I'm not going to go into. But the, the important point I make is that while Hamilton created the principles on which you can organize the, the finances and the, and the means, uh, this was not fully implemented until Lincoln, uh, until Lincoln's time, when he initiated what something called the Greenbacks, which launched a massive unleashing of industrial power of uh, potential. In, in science in, in the U.S. during the period of the Civil War. Uh, also, uh, the war assisted that. The, the need of the wars, of course, assisted that. Now, uh, Hamilton also established um, a um, society for uh, improvement of manufacturers. And he wanted the government to fund the development of manufacturers, research and development and development of manufacturers. And this was blocked by Jefferson and later Madison directly. They completely opposed the idea that there should be bounties or support for the, for the promotion and development by the government of science, of technology, uh, of manufacturers. They completely opposed it, and they, as they have today. And only during Lincoln's time and later only during during uh, FDR's time, who did the same thing that Lincoln did essentially, has the United States had a national policy of development? And, and Kennedy had a national policy of development too, but that didn't, that, that was blocked. And so this lack of a national policy of development 
is, is today most obvious in the current situation of the United States that we find ourselves in. And, uh, but the point is the Civil War did not defeat this crowd. The Civil War only made these people uh, bitter. Um, and also, the Civil, the Civil War did not eliminate the planner aristocracy. They came back. And they reestablished a similar system called Jim Crow in the late 1800s. And same, same system. And it was, and after the death of the last Civil War veteran, McKinley, who was president by assassination, the U.S. pretty much went uh, into a culture of degeneracy, led by a Woodrow Wilson's promotion of the Second Clan. And The Birth of a Nation, which was a movie about the revival of the Second Clan, was played uh, at the White House. Now, all these people talking about the Klan and the Ku Klux Klan and Ku Klux Klan this, nobody says that Wilson was the guy who, start, who promoted the Second Klan from the White House. Nobody says that. These same liberals praise Wilson. What's, what, what's wrong? They're not telling you that. Why are they going after, you know, Trump, who has no connections to these people, why haven't they gone after Woodrow Wilson? Now, so the first clan came up out of the Scottish Rites in the late, in the late 1800s. The second clan got going in the, during the administration of Woodrow Wilson. And it, uh, its, it's, par its parallel organization was the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. And out of that network came people like J. Edgar Hoover <coughs> of the FBI, who was, who was part of that Ku Klux Klan network. And he eventually, they eventually, with the help of Wall Street and the British, they established a, this, this agency, which played a very key role in the United States. Um, it was the operations run by the FBI that, that prevented FDR's choice for vice president in his final election before he died, Henry Wallace. And this process determined that Harry Truman, a racist, pro-Confederate minded person from Missouri became the U.S. president and then came the Cold War. Now I'm putting a lot of things together. The FBI role in covering up the assassination of Kennedy, the assassination of King, the assassination of, of Robert Kennedy, their role in going after LaRouche, their role in going after Noriega, their role in, in protecting 9-11, that's in the dossier, and their current role in going after Trump is all an extension and continuation of that tradition which never went away. And it's precisely this tradition that, uh, that enabled the United States, at, as starting with uh, after the assassination of McKinley, it's precisely this tradition which brought the United States into an alliance with the British and European colonialism in general. It's precisely this tradition in the U.S. Now, some of us talk about the American system, this and the American system, that there's a problem with that. Hamilton did not subscribe to any system. His system was scientific, technological progress, the development of the manufacturers, and the idea of, 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 of creating a nation that is that's economically, scientifically progressive. He didn't have an American system of tariffs, per se. He didn't even support high tariffs. He supported moderate tariffs to provide income to, to pay for, for improvements, for development. So this whole thing of our organization and the American system that we've been promoting has, in the past, has some problems. Because when, 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 when uh, and our organization still has problems with this, okay? Uh, when uh, Trump talks about the American system, it ain't Hamilton he's talking about. It's the system of Henry Clay which involves tariffs. Henry Clay was pro-slavery. He was for the slave empire. He played a major role in promoting the slave empire. And this is where the confusion comes in. 
American history books have completely uh, written out of the fact that this fight went on from the very beginning. And what we see today with the American century uh, as uh, in, in, a, in alliance with the British is a continuation of the same mentality that, that essentially that Jefferson represented, that the slave power of Virginia represented. And that's where we are right now with the situation in the United States. That slave power, which is no longer about um, African American slaves, but it's about enslaving the world to a, to a financial system. That slave power is now about to be defeated. And Virginia uh, is still the center of it. And that's where the Beltway is. That's where Washington, D.C. is. We, we had our movement in, headquartered in that area, and we moved it out to New York City. <laughs> and I'm glad we did. It saved our movement. <laughs> So, now, what's the problem? Now, if you watch the, the two-hour uh, full interview with Charlie Rose uh, given by Steve Bannon, you actually can see the problem. And, it, and you can see the problem in, in Steve Bannon's uh, wanting to have a, a trade war with China. And his comment that the United States will soon become a barbarian tributary to China as backward as Jamestown was to, the, to Britain back in uh, the good old days, back in the 1600s. So what, what's going on here? There is this problem, this problem of not having a universal conception of mankind and not having a, a conception of progress for all of mankind. And that is the new paradigm. And these people unfortunately do not have the new paradigm. Where Trump is going to go on all of this or how he's going to be recruited or whether we're going to end up in a nuclear war, I can't, I can't tell you. But this is the battle that we're involved in right now. And uh, this is the battle that we're, we're taking on. And we are contacting all of the Trump networks to, to organize this and to make this very clear. The United States has to change. Now, in the, in the, in the, in the Bannon interview, um, what was notable was that he, that Bannon um, said that they won the election on the model of Jeffersonian populism, which is, uh, Throw out the elite. Right? Throw out the elite. So they, they so basically they mobilize the emotions of people against the establishment. Okay, it's so number one. And the other one was American protectionism. American uh, 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 economic, ec you know, save America from who? from Chinese abuse, right? The Chinese, China didn't abuse just because their goods are coming in. It's not China which is abusing you. It's the international financial crowd. But, and, and, and Bannon knows that. He, works, he, worked, with, uh, he worked with Goldman Sachs. He, he understands this. But he can't, he can't break from his roots. He is from Virginia. He comes from a Virginia family, a military family from Virginia. He is, he, he knows better, I know, but his, his sympathy is with the South, the lost cause, emotion, but not necessarily that that's what he wants. It's, it's, he, he can't break with, with, with the mood. You can't break with this idea that America, um, that the Chinese should become the power that helps to develop the world. He can't deal with that. That is something he cannot deal with. And that America will be dwarfed by that.
And that is the problem of the establishment. That is what's going on. It's not Russia that they're afraid of. It's being submerged under an avalanche of progress. That's what they're afraid of. That's what's attacking the elite. That's what's attacking their, their self-conception. And that's the problem we have to deal with in the U.S. Because their system is going under and we have to replace it without a nuclear war. So I'm going to stop there. How long do we have before it goes under? You mean the financial system? Yeah.